Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, a delight to welcome you on behalf of the Center for Anglo-German Cultural Relations for uh, this academic year's BISF lecture series. My name is Rüdiger Görner, and um, as director of the Center, it is a particular privilege for me to um, welcome tonight's speaker. Sinclair Mackay is um, one of um, the most prolific um, authors you can imagine, because um, amongst his many books and his many essays and articles um, are um, studies on, for example, Bletchley Park, on Dunkirk, but um, there are two other books which um, uh, are the reason why he is um, tonight's speaker, who will open this year's uh, lecture series. And um, um, he has given us um, the, shall we say, the German tale of two cities, um, or the tale of two German cities, however you want to put this, namely um, the story of Berlin and the story of Dresden, most importantly for tonight's lecture. I think um, there is very few, few points where um, um, George Bernard Shaw and uh, George Orwell agreed, but they agreed on one thing, that um, in any major author, there is also a good journalist. They both believe this, and I think this certainly applies to uh, tonight's speaker. Sinclair Mackay is um, not only a prolific author of uh, books, but um, he also writes, as you know, for um, uh, our major periodicals and uh, newspapers. Um, at the time when they were still called broadsheets, uh, you could find him also in the Daily Telegraph and uh, the Times and other such periodicals. Now he's predominantly um, the uh, literary editor of um, The Spectator. And um, the illuminating articles, the illuminating insights that we get from him um, are uh, certainly second to none. Um, when I say that um, Sinclair is a prolific writer, then I should add um, he is also a meticulous researcher. That is to say what you find in his books and um, in particular um, the study on Berlin, life and death in the city that shaped this century, um, and the book on Dresden, The Fire and the Darkness, uh, the latter published just about two years ago, um, and um, the Berlin book just came out. Uh, then you will find that um, this wealth of insights, this um, stupendous knowledge of um, remarkable details about not just the grand history that is behind all of this, but um, the history as it were of daily life, uh, the history from below, so to speak, um, is very present in these books and in these studies. When I say uh, tales of uh, two German cities that I dare say are um, a very special and obtain a very special place in the German psyche. And um, there I say it's perhaps also to a certain extent in the British conscience. Um, then I really mean that the way in which um, um, Sinclair Mackay presents his tales to us um, always amounts to, um, shall we say, a celebration of the English language. And this is something which is um, nowadays actually quite rare. Um, this um, animating way of, of writing and bringing across a, a subject matter of uh, this extraordinary complexity, that is a great gift, this is a great uh, a talent, and of course um, uh, Sinclair Mackay um, has um, a great deal of that. Now um, tonight is the topic Dresden and the landscape of remembrance. And um, this landscape will also have pictures, it will have images, and I thank in advance um, Jana Riedl for administering that side of things. And uh, with all of that, I have the real pleasure to invite you, uh, Sinclair, to um, address us.
Oh, well, thank you very, very much. And thank you very much for that extraordinarily kind introduction. I mean, it really is way too kind uh, in many, many respects. Uh, thank you. Oh, incidentally, quick note, I'm not literary editor of The Spectator. I contribute to The Spectator. Uh, the, the literary editor would have been assassinated for that. But it's, it's uh, once again, such kind introduction and also such a great honour to be asked uh, to speak uh, to you all this evening. Thank you so much. Dresden is cradled by gentle hills and in the autumn there are sometimes dense pale fogs rising from the river Elba that envelop the streets and the skyline. Looking down from the top of those hills, a very good vantage point being the remarkable city archives, your view of Dresden is that of the tops of spires and domes emerging surreally from a sea of white they put that the, it's a view that puts one in tangentially in mind of a painting from exactly 200 years ago 1822 that painting is a study of Dresden at sunset by Carl Gustav Kerus now Carl Gustav Kerus uh, was one of Dresden's more remarkable citizens and has had a great deal of remarkable citizens across the years. Uh, he was a pioneer in obstetrics. Uh, he was a terrific expert botanist. He was also something of a pioneer in psychology. In artistic terms, because he was also an artist on top of that, he was a protege of the uh, perhaps even more remarkable Caspar David Friedrich. And again, when we think of this view of Dresden, uh, the, the city and its domes and spires rising from the mists, uh, there's also an irresistible reminder of this romantic artist, Caspar David Friedrich, and his famous painting of the wanderer looking above the sea of mists. Now, Caspar David Friedrich was another of the extraordinary artists who made Dresden his home. There is something about the atmosphere of his paintings, uh, as well as those of Carus, uh, numinous, faintly otherworldly, all those, all those empty ruins and all those strange towers in the mist, which also seems to align with the soul of the city. For all its wonderful beauty, there is something a little uncanny about Dresden. Most cities are palimpsests landscapes of layers that have accumulated over the different decades. Streets and districts are overlaid with new details, fresh architecture, and in some areas the past has to be heavily excavated. Dresden is different. Uh, next slide, please, if I may. Today, there is the appearance of an old city, the exact physical space where on one terrible night in 1945, there was only destruction and skeletal ruins. Now there are exquisite churches and exuberant architectural detailing where almost 80 years ago, there was only ash and blood and flesh. Dresden is a revenant and yet it is also intensely real. To any visitor, including those coming to Dresden from Britain, the city is abundantly welcoming, but its beauty also forms a challenge. The old town of Dresden exists despite the fact that it was destroyed by British bombing. And every street you walk down, every square you exult in, the glorious architecture says this is not just a city of ornament. This is not just what the eminent Jewish academic Victor Klemperer called a jewel box. This is a lesson in historical morality, made corporeal in regenerated stone and mortar. It is extremely unlikely that anyone visiting will be unaware of the horror of that history. For any British visitors, there is always that initial and slightly uncomfortable sensation of seeing two cities simultaneously. Dresden now, and a vision of Dresden burning. And on every February the 13th, the anniversary of that bombing, Dresden's citizens come together for hauntingly beautiful ceremonies and rituals of remembrance. History is not incidental. It pulses through all the veins of the city. Like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Dresden has become synonymous 
with the obscenity of total war. Dresdeners understand that history is not a static entity, an abstract study. Instead, they know that history is electrically alive. The past can be honored, but it can also be hijacked. In recent years, there have been those in Dresden, a few extremists on the far right, who have sought to turn mourning into anger, to weaponize the past in order to inspire future fury. Now, all of this we will explore in good time, but I'm talking to you both as an ardent lover of the city of Dresden and also as a member and proud trustee of the Dresden Trust. This is a charity concerned with regeneration and reconciliation that seeks to foster new friendships and new understandings in Anglo-German relations. It has also played its own significant part in the spectacular restoration of the city's aesthetic glory. When you visit Dresden, you will be drawn as though by gravity to the apparent 18th century wonder of the Frauenkirche, with its great dome surmounted by a golden cross and orb. The greater wonder is that this centuries old structure was paradoxically built 30 years ago. I will return to the Frauenkirche and to philosophical ideas of authenticity. But I will note here that the Golden Cross and the Orb were a British contribution initiated and seen through by the pioneers of the Dresden Trust. And there's also a website, Dresden, dresdentrust.org.uk, I will come back to that at the end, uh, that I warmly recommend to, to everyone. Next slide, please. I feel so self-conscious saying that. Thank you so much, Jan. <laughs> so let me lead you through uh, and among those cobbles and the close, beautiful alleys, the grand Catholic cathedral, the Baroque exuberance of the swing of Paris, and the rich gravity of the adjoining opera house, the grave dignity of the Schloss, and in addition to the Frauenkirche, the Kreuzkirche, home to a world-famous boys' choir, the harmonies of which have been heard right the way across the centuries. But walking through the streets at night, or along the elegant 18th century terrace running alongside the River Elbe, it is impossible not to reflexively look up, to imagine the terrible deep choral note of the approaching aeroplanes, to see flames begin to dance and rise, to see crowds of terrified people rushing for the ice-cold river as though by instinct. The question of how that horror should be commemorated and never forgotten and turned instead to new purpose is one that has informed the rebuilding of Dresden over the decades through different ideological regimes. And in today's fraught world, who would have imagined that we would once more see tanks rolling across invaded land and apartment blocks and people engulfed in flame, destroyed by missiles from the sky? The landscape of Dresden offers wider lessons on the tectonic plates of history. The story of the city, its streets continually suffused across the ages with the most exhilarating music and art, also raises fascinating and sometimes uncomfortable questions about Nazi complicity. It is certainly true that the Nazis cast as cold a shadow here as elsewhere that Dresden's Jewish population were persecuted every bit as cruelly as those elsewhere. It is also the case that the city, during the war, was ringed and filled with factories engaged upon producing ammunition and optical equipment and other vital military necessities. It was not just targeted because it was a glittering jewel on the Elbe. Dresden, even at that late final stage of the war still had some value to the Nazi regime. Meanwhile, in the earliest days of Nazism, from 1933, the city had seen book burning and denouncements of degenerate art. These lovely streets were, as with other cities in Germany, central to the nightmare of Kristallnacht in 1938. Yet the pathologically intense bombing of the city, a city best known in Britain for its exquisite porcelain and rich music, inspired a very particular reaction of shuddering horror, even from Winston Churchill himself. But it's also important to say that the atmosphere of the city is not 
on a day-to-day -day basis, mournful, quite the reverse. Go to Dresden in the summer and you will find a city where the warm sunset air is honeyed with joyous music. The best buskers in Europe, visitors from all over the world. Even the Soviet era monolithic blocks and shopping parades from Pragestrasse to Neustadt exude a warmth and a welcome that can feel startling in its effusion. Incidentally, that 1950s and 1960s GDR architecture is another slightly offbeat attraction in its own right, as we shall hear later. And it is on these streets, as your eye drifts over the mellow sandstone and the amber twilight, that you reach back long before the Second World War to an age when Dresden was only associated with rich artistic delight. In the late 19th century, the streets teemed with fashionable Americans. They even had their own church and their own local newspaper. There were a wide array of English governesses. Before that, in the mid 19th century, as the tides of Europe's revolution swept across the continent, the composer Richard Wagner was on the barricades with the radicals. Wagner, incidentally, is always indelibly associated with the darkest depths of anti-Semitism, partly because of Nazi enthusiasm for his work. In fact, according to the music historian Alex Ross, enthusiasm was also ex extended equally to others such as Bach and Bruckner. Wagner wasn't performed more than them, but it's true that Wagner was himself gravely anti-Semitic. Yet it's also interesting that when Dresden's Grand Synagogue was built by the same architect as its opera house, Wagner was rather taken by the structure and its lovely ornamental style. Uh, next slide, please, because I think we've got a rather lovely painting coming up. We have indeed a very famous lovely painting. We also think of the rich mid 18th century canvas landscapes of Bernardo Bellotto, who, as we see here, painted the riverscape of Dresden and other Dresden views, including the views from the old city and landscapes of the old city, in this uh, very particular crisp lemon light. Uh, next slide, please. We also have the haunting nightscape of the city's riverside, summoned by Johann Christian Dahl in the 19th century, I think uh, around 1839. Again, this is a painting that you could just spend just weeks staring and being immersed in. All these paintings seem to fix the city in time. The nocturnal river view that we see today from the same angle at which Dahl painted it is in some ways remarkably unchanged. It is the dull landscape, those, those glimmers of warm lights blurring and reflecting on a cold navy blue night that also seems to come to mind when we envisage all those English RAF pilots and crews, their Lancasters pushing through the icy air over the darkness of Germany, trying to evade the bright streaks of anti-aircraft fire as they inexorably approached their distant target. Just weeks before the end of the Second World War, on the cold night of February the 13th, 1945, the Allies chose to make Dresden their focus for a colossal bombing raid, which was fully intended to start an apocalyptic inferno that would leave the city as dust and ash. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, Jana. Some 796 bomber aircraft carrying thousands upon thousands of explosives from start fire starting incendiaries to vast bombs that could simply demolish homes flew out from the twilight, twilight airfields of England. They flew four and a half hours through the freezing darkness in formation. The first among them dropped marker flares, glowing green, red and blue against the inky sky. These fell right across the city, forming a bright target that the following bombers would take aim at. That night, the children of Dresden and their dread-filled parents and grandparents gazed at the twinkling sky, at the mesmerizing colors falling from the dark. The lights were termed Christmas trees. This was just after 10 o'clock. The city's air raid sirens had been crying out the alarm since 
but for the civilians of Dresden, there were no special reinforced bomb shelters. Only basements and cellars, some of which connected, ran like a maze beneath the streets of the old town. The nature of this maze meant that rather than being shelters, these cellars would instead become the most grotesque death trap. That moment in time, just before the first of the fires that would gather together into a hellish storm, captured some of the terrible and troubling ambiguities about Dresden under Nazi rule. For the Jewish academic Victor Klemperer, whose own forbidden diaries of the Nazi years now provide such an intense and chilling and moving insight into the slowly suffocating nightmare suffered by the Jews. This was another dim, cold night spent with his wife and the many other occupants of the substandard housing into which they had been forced. A house that might be entered at any time by SS men for the purpose simply of terrorizing those within. That day, during the day of February 13th, it had been Victor Klemperer's job to move around the city, delivering letters to other allocated Jewish houses. These were notifications of deportation. Anyone to receive such a letter would be told in the blandest language that they had to pack a small case with enough clothes for two or three days. There was no hint about the destination. But in Dresden, it was already whispered and widely known. Fear kept a daily grip on thousands of hearts. And so it was that Victor Klemperer was himself exhausted and heartsick at the obscenity of the task he had been made to carry out, and at the certainty that he himself would shortly be receiving such a letter. Out in the streets outside and down towards Pragestrasse and the Grand Railway Station beyond, there had been all evening a great confusion of carts and horses and rural refugees. These were people from Pomerania and Silesia who had been fleeing the ineluctable advance of the Red Army. They brought with them stories of atrocity and torture and sexual violence and savage murder. The stories were true. These refugees were now pointing towards the West, towards no de destinations that they could think of, just simple sanctuary. Refugees were also teeming through the railway station, having been brought in on packed steam trains from those eastern towns. There were old men and young women and bewildered children. Some made their ways to alleys nearby to relieve themselves. This was not something that fastidious Dresdeners were accustomed to. And yet, even amid the noise and the confusion on that dark, blacked-out February evening, some of Dresden's civic structure and spirit remained firmly in place. There was a 15-year-old member of the Hitler Youth called Winfried. His diaries gave no indication that he ever subscribed to Nazi ideology. Instead, I suppose like a number of other teenage boys across the years, he was fixated on stamp collecting. He and other boys presented themselves that evening to help guide the refugees to makeshift dormitories and school gymnasiums. They were picking groups up at the station and leading them patiently through the old town, across the bridges of the Elbe, and into the streets of the new town across the river. Also on duty were the nurses and doctors working in the city's great hospitals. At this point in the war, there were shortages of all sorts of medicine, but the duty of care was still absolute. A key figure was a senior medic called Dr. Albert Fromm, he had never been a Nazi. A grave and thoughtful man, he had devoted his life to the health of his fellow citizens. His resourcefulness and bravery would be much called upon in the infernal hours and days to come. Elsewhere to the east of the city, there were American prisoners of war, one of whom, a young novelist to be called Kurt Vonnegut, noted grimly that he was being temporarily held in an abattoir, Slaughterhouse Five. The children of the city had that day been celebrating the annual Shrove Carnival. Even amid the care of war, they were dressed up in an array of colorful fancy dress. That night, a very few were still wearing, at their own insistence, clown collars and bow ties. Their parents and grandparents had sought to shield them from the harshness of the world. 
a city of some 625,000 people. The center of that city at 10 p.m. was still crowded with refugees. As the air raid alarm sounded and the so-called Christmas trees started falling, there were those like Winfried, the 15-year-old Hitler youth boy, who was still outside on the streets, far from their customary basement shelters. The bombardment, when it started properly, had a demonic character. It wasn't just the smashed roofs and the thousands of fires started instantaneously. It was the poltergeist properties of the shock waves. Witnesses recalled closed doors bulging inwards and then collapsing, of other doors within tenements violently slamming and opening again, of the brick walls of cellars suddenly being sucked inwards. On the edges of the city, some recalled going outside and watching, mesmerized, as the flames began con conjoining. And the pilots and the crews in the air, despite their role, these young men on the whole were intelligent and sensitive, watched with a kind of horrified wonder as the city beneath their planes became a latticework of gold. The spreading fires rushing through streets and illuminating the shapes of those roads and junctions. All the way through that infernal night, the bombing came in three waves. The firestorm, once it built, was almost as if nature itself had been provoked into atrocity. All those thousands of fires, now joined, formed a vortex of flame that rose a mile into the icy sky. It turned the air inside out sucking oxygen into its maw. Those close to it on the street were pulled up into a tornado of fire. And in those cellars beneath, all those civilians huddled on rough chairs had no inkling of the mortal danger they were in. First came the, car first came the carbon monoxide, inducing sleepiness, then suffocation, then sometimes heart attacks and death. And through this, the volcanic heat pulsated through the brickwork. When their bodies were eventually recovered, many were found to be shrunken. In the space of one hellish night, some 25,000 people were either burned or suffocated or crushed to death. It is a figure that cannot realistically be envisaged or imagined. Next slide, please. Thank you, Yana. And the next morning, a day that looked like night as the ashes of the slaughter lingered in the sky. Those citizens who had survived the horror made their way into what had been the old town and found that it had been pulverized into smoking, burning dust. This then was the mutated landscape that signified not only obscene slaughter of innocent civilians, but also the crushing of memory and identity. Home was rendered unfamiliar and alienating. Amid the vast piles of bodies taken to pyres, cremated quickly for fear of spreading pestilence, traumatized Dresdeners walked through ash and absence. Entire streets had disappeared and once familiar landmarks had vanished into the earth. Kurt Vonnegut, whose job it was as a prisoner to help dig bodies out from cellars, recalled that the city resembled the surface of the moon. Next slide, please. Thank you, Yana. Ah, as I say, it's beyond imagination in so many ways. Here then was the landscape that was to be reshaped and recreated. In 1945, after the capitulation of the Nazis, it was the Soviets who took over the administration of Dresden, deep as it was within East Germany. The Stalinist architecture that would come to characterize the new housing blocks of the city was stark and rectilinear, yet the functionality was not intended to be grim. Rather, these new modern apartments would offer, or at least hold out the promise of, new comforts to working class laborers. And by the 1960s, Implacable brutalism came to Dresden, as it came to pretty much every city in Western Europe too. 
Indeed, the monolithic rectangular blocks that formed the new Praga Strasse shopping district were in some ways a little more elegant and pleasing than equivalent efforts as far away as Croydon and Dundee. But for so many years, the heart of the Baroque old town remained in fractured ruins like shattered teeth. Though the Soviets had a jealous dislike of religion, the city's venerable Lutheran church, the Kreuzkirche, was marked out for reconstruction. The bombs of that night had shattered the roof. For 10 years, the church remained a ruin. In 1955, it was rebuilt in scratch code, gray, austere, dignified, but also unmistakably part of the new Soviet world. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jana. Ah. The Baroque masterpiece of the Frauenkirche, designed by George Barr, which had once boasted a dome that had been painted by Caspar David Friedrich, by Bernardo Bellotto, by Johann Christian Dahl, which had seemed in itself absolutely integral to the soul of Dresden, was still, in those post-war years, and for many decades afterwards, an empty, shattered stump. In the snows of winter, or the rains of autumn, the remaining smoke-blackened stones remained an unintended testimony to the horror of that night. The communist authorities had other priorities, plus not a great deal of money. Incidentally, in the 1980s, the rubble and ruins of the Fraunkirche would have been a site of daily familiarity to Vladimir Putin. At the time, he was a KGB officer posted to the city. When he gazed on those ruins, what did he feel? What did he see? It was in 1989, the year of the collapse of the German Democratic Republic and the beginning of the collapse of the Soviet system, that the citizens of Dresden first seriously mooted the rebuilding and restoration of that church's beauty. And by seriously, I meant that they were able to get into a position where at last they could start thinking about the fundraising and uh, the, 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 the thinking about the extraordinary logistics uh, that such an undertaking would uh, involve. By 1990, the international call for donations was being heeded. The proposition was, in its own way, staggering. Imagine a parallel. Say, in the London Blitz, the dome of St Paul's Cathedral had collapsed under bombing, and that it remained rubble and ruins for 50 years after that. Imagine then the call not only to rebuild and restore the Dome of St Paul's, but to do so with perfect fidelity to every last tiny detail. This was what was being proposed in Dresden, to summon forth once more the august spirit of the 18th century. Next slide, please. Thank you. The interior of the Frauenkirche had been a wonder in its own right. Galleries of white and pale blue, natural light pouring through vast windows and the structure reaching up to a breathtakingly painted dome depicted with allegories of faith, hope and love as conveyed in the four gospels. A symphony of pale pinks and rose reds and rich royal blues. The term restoration does not quite do justice to the miracle of art and engineering that has been performed here. The mathematical calculations made by George Barr in the 1700s were replicated here in order that the intricate balance of the vast structure was true. Meanwhile, the Dresden Trust was instrumental in the recreation of the golden orb and cross that crowns the structure. The commission went to a silversmith in London one of the men who worked on the finely wrought detailing was, by extraordinary and haunting and moving chance, the grandson of one of the RAF bomber pilots who had taken part in the 1945 raid. But the truly fascinating thing is the way that this regenerated church, the heart of the old town, provides the focus for mourning, for remembrance, but also for celebration. There is joy in those choral services. It and the restored streets all around do something else though. They make all those who visit 
look history directly in the face. Here, the present is superimposed upon the past. We can see through the solid restorations and at the ruins that once lay beneath. We are supposed to. The intention is explicit. But more, we also see a more distant past merging with the present. The skyline that was painted by Johann Christian Dahl, the eerie dawn prospects summoned by Caspar David Friedrich. In the main square of the old town, it does not take more than a flicker of the imagination to envisage the vast pyres piled high with bodies. This is not an exercise in morbidity. Somber remembrance is built into the fabric of Dresden. Yet that remembrance is also evoked by art and music. In the summer months, music is part of the chemical composition of the city streets. Here you will find, as I think I've mentioned, some of the finest buskers in Europe, from violin soloists to a cappella opera. All of this summons the spirit and the soul of the city that drew worldwide visitors long before the Nazis ever found their brief foothold. And it is quite stunning how, in the space of a few streets, a city can hint at the sorrow and the joys of the past simply through its shape and its structure, the grand spires, the sky-filling domes. Every February the 13th, every year, the people begin to gather here in this square and by the Kreuzkirche too, as the shades of evening draw on. First, in the early evening, people form a human chain around the centre of the old town, partly symbolic, partly practical. This is a means of barring those very few far-right activists who wish to hijack the historic day of remembrance for their own extremist ends. Later on, at 9.45pm, all the bells in the old city begin ringing violently. The noise is profoundly uncanny. And indeed, if at that moment you had no idea of the history of Dresden, you would be seized with a primal unease. These bells invoke the fear and alarm caused by the air raid sirens that at that point started their throaty wail as the first of those hundreds of bombers approached Dresden in the cold night air. When you are out there, it is impossible not to look up at the black sky. The bells in all their frightening echoing discordancy ring out until 10.03 p.m., the moment at which the British bombs started falling. Then there is a sudden gaping silence. In the square before the frown period, candles are lit one after the other. Next slide, please. Thank you, Joanna. Yes, I thought there was one more. The city has put a great deal of emphasis on reconciliation, the fostering of true friendship in the hope that no such horror can ever happen again. Of course, if that were all it took to stop conflict, today's world, in all of the grimness of fresh bombardment, would look very different. But Dresden does something that is genuinely valuable and irreplaceable. Here in Dresden, History is not propaganda, nor a means of lecturing or hectoring. It is instead a continual presence in buildings and streets so well restored that you might mistake them for their 18th century originals. They are not setting out to be copies or reproductions. The structure of the Frauenkirche might be modeled upon its destroyed 18th century forebear, but it has its own organic authenticity. You can sit in the galleries, you can climb the ever, title spi ever tighter spirals of stairs towards the church's tower, you can sing and add your own voice to choirs of unearthly beauty. This is not mere reproduction. There is nothing remotely ersatz about it. It is as real and as textured and as suffused in passion as the original. And if the 18th century architect George Barth were to enter it now, it might, not be, it might not be at all obvious to him that it had been reduced to rubble. It is not just the appearance of beauty, it is the essence of it, 
breathing once more through wood and stone. This, then, is the genius of Dresden. History stands not as an accusation, but rather as an affirmation of hope and love. There were those who sought to crush this beauty from existence, but that beauty in time has simply flowered once more. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, <laughs> for allowing me to, to speak. <laughs> Thank you ever so much, and I know I speak for everyone uh, when I thank you most profusely for this uh, truly moving and um, uh, far-reaching uh, lecture that you gave. And um, when I said earlier on that the sheer plasticity that you bring to uh, history, that you, the way you um, portray things and you analyze things by portraying, that is a real art. So uh, I no, think not at all. It's, 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 it's Dresden that is the, the real it's art. It's, it's the it's most Dresden. remarkable city. And the, the first time I set foot in Dresden, as I say, there was that. There's a, being British, there is that sense of unease when you initially because you you feel that, uh, that you feel the responsibility of history. You feel that yeah. can, that that can weight of guilt and responsibility. But as I say, the the, it, the, the, the welcoming atmosphere. I mean, this is, it's a place I've always wanted to get back to again and again and again. And you know the. To, to stay there time after time. And I've made some wonderful friends there as well. Um, I, I want to retire there. <laughs> <laughs> Quite an aim, very good. Now, <laughs> you, you mentioned by way of uh, introducing our discussion now, um, you mentioned uh, beauty as a challenge initially, that this beauty to a certain extent represented and still represents a challenge. Yes. You also spoke of, uh, very interestingly, of um, the present uh, being superimposed upon the past. Um, the reverse obviously also applies to a certain extent, does it not? I mean, the presence of the past uh, somehow is the kind of thing that superimposes um, uh, itself, as it were, onto the sheer presence of what Dresden represents. Yes. Yes, no, very much so. And I suppose it very much depends on the point of view, because I suppose for, for Dresdeners, uh, I imagine it probably it would be that way around rather than so the, the point of view of the visitor would be different from the point of view of uh, it, the, uh, its citizens, uh, the citizens who would have that kind of past inside them um, uh, as well. And so, as you say, uh, they would see. Uh, Yes, uh, the, 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 the past would always be present. I mean, most famously in the, in the case of the Frauenkirche, it is explicitly there in the blackened uh, masonry at the base of the structure, uh, mm -hmm. which was kept there deliberately to, to, to show where, where the, the, the old and the new structure uh, could, could conjoin. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's, it's present in so many different other corners of the city as well, though, isn't it? It's, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about it across the river, uh, Neustadt too, um, which uh, which wasn't so heavily bombed. And there's a lot of the uh, the, the 19th century uh, the stru st street structure uh, still stands today. But it has that kind of again, there is that kind of awareness of all those different layers and levels of history, um, all the way up to the extraordinary military uh, military museum uh, up on the hill, uh, designed by Daniel Lipskin. So it's it's there in every kind of uh, it's there in every corner of the city. And as you say, it, it can go the other way around that. Uh, it's not just like being ghosts, but it's just always being aware of that, that presence of the past. Yes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours. Um, questions, please. Either in the chat or, well, best in the chat, I think. We have uh, Marianne Howarth, please. Yes. In um, Professor Gurner's introduction, he referred to your wonderful use of language. I've read many of your pieces. I've never heard you speak before. And I'd like to start by saying how um, brilliant your uh, use of language in this talk was. Thank you very, very much for that. I've really, really enjoyed it. I'm, no. I married into a family of professional writers and um, I really appreciate that. But to come no. to what uh, I really want to talk about, my own academic background is that I started my working life in Coventry University many, many years ago, while the Germany was still divided. And of course, I became very aware of the relationship between Coventry Cathedral 
and yeah. Coventry City with Dresden. Yes. Um, in my own area of academic specialism, or at least my main area of academic specialism, is relations between Britain and the GDR. And I have paid many visits to Dresden, both while it was still part of the GDR and more recently. Although I have to say, um, the last time I was there, and especially wanted to go to the Frauenkirche, it was closed because they had a concert that evening. Oh, no. So, oh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> now I have two questions of detail. Um, uh, one is, and I hope I understood what you said correctly. Did I understand you correctly to say that there were no air raid shelters in Dresden um, during the Third Reich? And um, if so, was that because um, no air raids were anticipated in that area? And my second question, again, if I've understood you correctly, um, the, um, the bombing of Dresden coincided with the Tuesday of the carnival period. Yes. Um, I hadn't been aware of that. Mm. So did, did we uh, and the US choose the date to coincide with that, or was it a coincidence? There's no two questions. No, well, thank you very much. For, uh, thank you very much for those two questions. Remind me very quickly the first question again. Um, um, what, did you, had I answered it correctly that there were no air raid shelters? Yes, no, thank you, thank you, yes. No, well, in fact, uh, the, the case, there, there was, uh, there were a couple of, uh, there were a couple of uh, fortified air raid shelters. They were specifically for the use of Gauleiter, Martin Rutschmann, and the Nazi party hierarchy. So there were, as far as I know, the two specific, as a, properly concrete lined air raid shelters they were only for the use of party grandees and party officials for all the other citizens it really was a matter of basements and cellars and actually i mentioned at the very start of the talk the uh, the, the city archives which have done the most amazing job in pulling together just hundreds and hundreds of diaries and memoirs and accounts uh, that they, they've created it absolutely beautifully and in so many of those accounts you read that the people are not even in some sort of full basements they're in half basements uh you know with, with some street level kind of fan lines this was the prospect they were facing and i think partly it was it wasn't it wasn't malevolence um but rather negligence on the part of the authorities they're just yeah. the person was so far deep east in Germany, that the, the, the British bombers would just either wouldn't get that far or just wouldn't regard it as being enough of a potential target to get that far. Uh, you know, as of Dresden, although it had that kind of wartime ministry, still wasn't quite on the scale of Chemnitz or, 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 Leipz or Leipzig in those terms. And so the, 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 the Nazi authorities wouldn't have regarded it as being uh, a kind of likely target. The second part, and the, the, you mentioned also uh, Carnival and Shrove Tuesday. The other terrible aspect of the story I find, certainly when, when reading through the RAF archival material that we have here now, all the, the primary sources that we have over here, is a kind of, a kind of fundamental ignorance actually of, of Dresden. I suspect that Arthur Bomber Harris, as he was known, the head of, of Bomber Command, uh, would have had only the very haziest idea of, of Dresden as a city. He wouldn't have understood that it had, was filled with the most beautiful Baroque architecture, with the most amazing art, with the, 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 this fantastic kind of heritage. I don't suspect any of that would have occurred to him. Uh, Dresden came fourth in the list of potential targets uh, uh, for that night. They got bumped up to kind of first. As I say, it did have its kind of military uses. But one thing I don't think they knew about was the fact that it had been uh, the, the special kind of carnival day for the children. The fact that they still had that carnival day in February 1945, I thought was uh, an extraordinary testament to the remaining parents and the grandparents of the city to, to try and protect the small children from you know, the, the darkness of the world around them. And as I say, there are so many, so many accounts of, of children. There were some children who were dressed up especially as Charlie Chaplin. There were some who were dressed up as cowboys. It's always interesting to see how much uh, American cultural influence remained in that, the city in 1945, when you would imagine the Nazi authorities had stamped it all out. The, it was still kind of lingering traces. And that gave another some terrible I think dimension of the story is that I think there would, would have been a number of people in Dresden who would have who lived in terrible fear of the Red Army and in you know, in, in some senses could rightly so, but who 
imagined that the British and the Americans were more benevolent, uh, and that when they did eventually prevail, uh, that, that their lives would be more peaceful. So the shock of what happened that night and the trauma and the obscenity and the atrocity of what happened that night uh, genuinely was out of the blue. And as I say, uh, it's, again, it's almost too horrible to imagine. Those, those people just huddled in those brick, uh, those brick cellars underneath the, underneath the old town. And as I say, what was a, a maze of Warren? There were some exits that led out to one of the great parks. There were some exits that led out by the Frown Kirchhoff. And because of all these different exits and entrances, uh, the, the ventilation was such that the firestorm and the heat of the firestorm eventually just could roared through. And, 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 yeah, it's, it's horrible. But that fascinated to, uh, to, to hear about uh, the, the relations between uh, Dresden and Coventry in the GDR years, because I know that uh, there were some artists who came from Dresden in, I think, the mid-1950s to Coventry. Am I right about that? Who put on an yes. exhibition? Yes, you were. And I'd yes. love to know, yes, yes, I'd love to know more about that. <laughs> and then those kind of early, that, that, uh, the, the, the early kind of years of, of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yes. It, it, I started researching into relations between Britain and the GDR, but and then more recently Coventry and Dresden, but I, I started my research in the, the mid-1970s. I'm probably the longest serving <laughs> academic with an interest <laughs> in the area. Um, I'll oh. be in touch with you uh, out of this. I don't want to take up time um, no, from well, other, no, well, thank, um, well, well, but thank you again. Thank you. No, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Really one. <clears throat> No, thank, thank you. you. I, I, look forward to, I look forward to learning more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen, please? Um, whilst you think about possible questions, um, I'm very grateful to you, uh, Sinclair, that you uh, referred so extensively to uh, Victor Klemperer, because Klemperer, after all, is uh, one of the extraordinary key witnesses uh, in, in all of that. And, yes. Um, I'm especially grateful to you for um, uh, telling us what has actually happened on that day before it, before the raid and the tasks that uh, Klemperer had to fulfill, um, gruesome as they were. That was, uh, yeah, I mean, again, just the, well, I mean, there's a bit of the, the, the collected diaries, I mean, as, as you will know, as you will know so well, the, the collected diaries, uh, pre war, during the war, and after the war, too, are just mm. such an extraordinary kind of the flashlight, really, uh, on uh, the, the, not only his life and the life of the people, but it's just so illuminating in so many different, so many different kind of ways. His is just the most mesmerizing, mesmerizing kind of voice, and so kind of human in the face of all that uh, inhumanity that he faced. And one of the most extraordinarily moving things I found about uh, his, his diaries was that uh, not only was his intellect always kind of going at a full blast, but he was, he always saw the tiny points of redemption in, in, in all of that darkness. He always saw mm. kindness mm -hmm. and he always noted kindness. And I just found that almost unbearably moving, particularly at a time when it's just, when the persecution was just intense and ever increasingly suffocating, just to, to, to have the humanity to note the people who just, even the, in the smallest gestures of, 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 gener of forbidden generosity. Mm -hmm. uh, it, what an extraordinary human being. Thank you. Uh, we have David Anderson, please. Hello. Hi, Sinclair. Hi, Rudiger. Um, Hi. Thank, thanks, Sinclair, for such an evocative um, talk. You really made me want to visit um, Dresden. I oh, just you must, you must. I just wanted to ask, I mean, you, you, you spoke, you cited a few examples of, um, of, of people in Dresden who were not Nazis or the, the Hitler Youth who was not a de devoted Hitler Youth. I think you used this um, expression. You also spoke a bit about to people today, or the, the, the um, efforts to restrict the um, uh, instrumentalization of the bombing of Dresden by um, far right groups. Uh, but I wondered if you wanted to elaborate any more on this, on 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 this kind of topos of the of the presentation of Germans in Dresden, in particular, as victims, and and I'm and I'm thinking, um, and, and you know the way this has been instrumentalized, and I guess I'm thinking in particular um, of David Irving's um, uh, first book on the destruction of Dresden. Um, mm -hmm. And which in fact is mentioned by Vonnegut in, as one of his reference points in Slaughterhouse Five, 
which was that then latterly shown to have bit, to have you know massaged the statistics and, and actually become part of a rather sinister um you know effort on irving's part and i just wanted to 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 um hear what you had to say about or you know the, the sense of working in a, in this parallel space and how you, um how you respond to the to these um to these other uses of this kind of dresden um topos well um, i mean it's just uh, the, the, this is i mean the, i suppose what i was hoping to get across this evening is that it's, it's, and is Dresden has also taken the greatest care with history, um, and the, the city kind of embodies the precise need for that. The, the, the history isn't just a, a, a game of kind of academic to and fro, where people can argue things out from various kind of ideological extremes or, or even centrist kind of positions until the cows come. The history has a living uh, kind of uh, absolutely living kind of morality to it. And I suppose what I found during the research for the book, um, many, many, many happy, happy weeks in, in Dresden, as I say, in those remarkable city archives with the most amazing, brilliant kind of archivists and Professor Thomas Kubler, uh, reading so many uh, memoirs and diaries. I mean, what you're not, uh, the, the, the term victims is, uh, is, I think, difficult because what you're basically saying is, is uh, we're just talking about civilians, basically. Um, and, you know, the same would be true today of, of, uh, of people being bombed now. What you're interested in, really, when you get away from, you know, so who was a Nazi and who wasn't, very, the, 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 actually not that many people were full-time members of the Nazi parties, and even fewer were members of any kind of hi Nazi hierarchy. Uh, basically, I'm talking about some mothers and grandparents and school children. And as I failed to mention in the talk, actually, huge numbers of forced labourers who were working in these factories. So Dresden also had huge numbers of people from all across Europe. Uh, I suppose you might say, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that from the very start, Dresden has understood the, 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 delicate, the delicacy of history and the, the dangers of, of, of history being propagandized. Uh, don't forget that the Soviets uh, tried to weaponize the bombing of Dresden against the Americans and the British in the immediate post-war years. If you go to the Military Museum of Dresden now, which I really recommend, it's, it's a fantastic spot, they have fascinating posters from the post-war years, uh, basically showing American and British bombers and saying, these were the devils, these were the, these were the devils that destroyed your city. Trust now in, uh, in, in the arms of the Soviets, we will rebuild together. So you can see history already uh, as being hijacked in those post-war years. But what the city has done particularly about, but from the 1990s onwards, and it was filled me with the most amazing sort of admiration, really, is, is being much, much more clear-eyed and much more kind of uh, human about it, I suppose, uh, in a sense. I don't know if that's really kind of uh, answered the question, but uh, <laughs> I'm struggling with myself here. But I suppose that's what I would say in response, that every generation comes along will, will try and sees history for its own purposes, even if they're doing it unconsciously, and sometimes they are doing it unconsciously. But uh, the, the, the people of Dresden are perhaps ahead of many of us uh, when it comes to the curation of the part. Thank you. More questions, please. One. I mean, the literary image um, of uh, what you uh, explained to us um, is, of course, also pretty varied. I mean, we have in, 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 in German literature, you have a spectrum from Durst Grünbein's poems about um, the so-called Dresden porcelain right over to um, the by now notorious Uwe Tellkamp, who obviously is closer to um, the uh, right wing radicals there. Yeah. Um, and you have uh, Michael Göring, who wrote a novel about Dresden, very much uh, looking of the, the post-war years. What, how was it that people coped with looking at ruins for so long, for example? Yeah. I think your question was extremely interesting when you picture Putin uh, being there uh, in, in, in post-war Dresden as a KGB uh, um, supremo looking at these ruins, looking at the Frauenkirche as it was. And I mean, I remember myself um, visiting this site in 1973, and um, you had sheep uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, grassing around there. It was quite right. extraordinary. Right. Um, 
you know, what does what 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 was the impact, so to speak, um, of uh, being confronted with these ruins? Because after all, they were for a long, long time, despite the uh, uh, good efforts of rebuilding um, as soon as possible. But nonetheless, um, yes, the absolutely. predominant image of Dresden was very long uh, the time these ruins. Yes, um, and the psyche, the psychological effect of that. Uh, I think well, it's also, yes, but there was uh, the, the, the novelist Eric Kastner, who was uh, the, uh, yeah. here most famous for any of the children's novel, but actually his adult novels are the, uh, the, 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 as gripping, if not more gripping. And he was, uh, I think, either born or brought up in Dresden. I think it was one of the two, uh, but he'd lived most of his life in Berlin. Uh, at 1945, Eric Kastner was still in Berlin. He was contemplating going on the run from the Nazi authorities because he thought, that's it, you know, that my number is finally up. Uh, they're not going to tolerate me anymore. Uh, but he survived the war, and it was in the post-war years he finally came back to Dresden, and he described how it was uh, impossible to, to navigate his way around because there were no familiar streets that he could uh, place himself in anymore. And these were streets that he had known in childhood that were absolutely could have impressed upon his memory. This sort of spatial, the spatial geometry of the place had been sort of absolutely erased, and he had no kind of uh, no bearings at all. Um, and the desolation that comes with that, uh, that kind of the yawning of emptiness. Uh, no, I mean, this is kind of extraordinary, extraordinary to contemplate in so many ways. And those who, 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 who lived through that night or who saw relatives carried out of those terrible cellars, you know, the, the, there's that, uh, the, the, the silence, I suppose, that then fell on, mm. on many on many families, on many people, uh, just the, 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 that general reluctance then to speak about the war in the years or in the years and the decades afterwards. Um, is there a greater sense around Dresden that, uh, that, thanks to the city archives and other such uh, and other such kind of resources, that the, the, these stories are finally becoming known in the way they weren't in the sixties and seventies that people had decided to take it. Mm. We have the stretch, please. After it is Robert, yes. Robert, yes. Robert, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm masquerading with as Astrid. Ah. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've been talking for a while and I don't know how much you've heard, so I'll say it all over again. Yes, no, no, the first I'm thing I wanted to say was to thank you very much um, for your talk. Um, the second is to say I'm going to do something wicked um, and um, ask the question that you didn't ask. I mean, we've talked about Putin, um, and when Putin bombs innocent civilians, it is regarded in the um, words of the propagandists as a war crime. And my question yes. is, was the bombing of Dresden, in your view, a war crime? I, uh, th th I'm not going to make you go read the book, uh, but I, but I did, I kind of, uh, I formulated what I thought was quite a careful response to that in the sense that war crime is a specific legal term, um, or certainly has been, become so in the, in the post-war years, an atrocity, certainly, an, an abomination and an obscenity, but I, I'm still slightly stuck on war crime itself. Um, and if it was a war crime, who then was the chief criminal? Was it uh, Sir Arthur Harris? Uh, was it Sir Charles Portal, who ultimately um, uh, approved and encouraged the raid? Uh, was it uh, Charles, was it Charles Lindemann? I, I forget his name now offhand, but the, basically the, the architect of the of the, the whole business of morale bombing. In the first time, I mean, the very phrase morale bombing, uh, setting people's houses on fire would damage their morale rather than killing them outright. I mean, the, the, even the phrasing, just the technocratic phrasing uh, had a, a, a whiff of pure evil about it. If Dresden was a war crime, that would also make the bombing of uh, Hamburg, uh, presumably a, a war crime too, and Cologne, and Lübeck, uh, Frankfurt, all the cities that were bombed across Germany, um, because the intention uh, was, was the same. They were, it's certainly true that Arthur Harris was horrifically fascinated by the idea of firestorms. Um, they were very difficult to create. You needed the right conditions and hideously for the people of Dresden on that night, February 13th, with very little wind, uh, very little some cloud cover, they suddenly had the perfect conditions to create this, this nightmare of nature. 
But the other difficulty I have with the phrase war crime is that, if, again, if you go back to the Imperial War Museum and the RAF Museum, which holds all sorts of diaries of uh, crew members of bombers who flew out uh, to Dresden, but also to flew out on a number of other missions, and you read their diaries, you, you're not reading the diaries of cold-blooded killers. This is, uh, this is the awful, awful, terrible thing. You're reading the diaries of, of uh, young men in their 20s who were kind of uh, smart and kind of intelligent and surprisingly sensitive too, who knew uh, that the very fact of being in bomber command meant that their life expectancy uh, was incredibly limited. They knew that every time they went up in the air in one of those bombers, there was a very strong chance that they would be that they wouldn't be coming back, that they'll be plummeting through darkness to their deaths in fire. The, the courage it must have taken on their parts to go out on uh, flight after flight after flight, uh, again, is kind of scarcely conceivable. So would you accuse them of being war criminals too, the people who actually unleashed the bombs? Would, and they would have to stand trial too um, in, in, this, in this putative in this putative. So I suppose what I'm saying is that I'm still, I, I, I wrestle with it, is what I'm saying still. I think it's, 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 you know, it's, it, you're perfectly entitled to go and throw paint over a, a statue of Arthur Harris, uh, because he was, there, there was something, he very much hated the German people. There's absolutely no question about that. He was kind of pathological about it. And there was something genocidal in the way that he wanted to stamp out what he saw as German culture. There's, that's absolutely undeniable too. But as I say, this, the, the, the responsibility extends out far, far, far beyond him. Um, and I'm not sure who best would serve. Also, uh, where, there, where then would you stand on the bombing of Tokyo? Not, uh, the, the, not the atomic bombings, but the bombing of Tokyo, on March 10, 1945. And in addition to this, the, the, the Americans came back to bomb Dresden in April 1945, some weeks after the British bombed it. So would the Americans be war criminals too? As I say, it, is, it is widens out to an extent where it doesn't dim the atrocity or the obscenity uh, of what happened, but I'm guessing you take a different view. Um, I, think, I think I probably do, actually. But I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to you for your wrestling. Um, I, I was deeply shocked when um, it was decided to put a, a, a statue of Arthur Harris up. Um, and it just so happened that I was writing an article about the, the bombing of Hamburg at that particular time. Um, right. And I do, I do wonder about, about how discourse um, allows certain things to be thought and other things not to be thought. Um, I think, but, yes, and um, also the, uh, the, 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 matters. And the particular horror of Dresden, is not just the beauty, not just the indiscriminate death of so many civilians, but the fact that it happened just, just at the very, very end of the war, when it was known, that, that February 1945, it was known that in whatever shape or form the war was going to be coming to a conclusion. It wasn't good. They knew it wasn't going to be dragging on for another two or three years. And so why then? Why, why go for, for, for Dresden right at the end? And as I say, it is perfectly possible that on the technical level, they were looking at all these, uh, all the factories producing war material and optical <laughs> all the technical kind of stuff. And they were looking at the busy railway junction, which was ferrying soldiers still to the Eastern Front. Um, and you know, there were theories that it was in some way helping Stalin uh, and the Red Army if they bombed Dresden. Uh, these things, I think, are just kind of unknowable now. It was more atavistic than that. I think that's absolutely unquestionable. There was something atavistic and primeval, uh, really. And, and it, was just, it was just somebody somewhere saying, make it stop, make the war stop. And the only way you can make it stop is just by unleashing bigger and bigger fires. As I say, it doesn't, it doesn't lessen the horror at all, but, uh, but yes. I mean, the strange thing, is it not, uh, is that um, quite a lot of the factories for um, optical instruments and precision instruments were, uh, in fact, in the Neustadt. And um, in and fact, what you, what you just said earlier on, that the Neustadt was, interestingly enough, not so badly hit. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, in the Altstadt, uh, there is an absolute certainty that those industries obviously were not. Yes, they weren't there. Yes. So I'm afraid the um, the argument in favour of um, referring to this particular uh, wave of bombardments um, as uh, as a war crime, I think, is um, is pretty strong. Yeah. Yes, uh, I know. I mean, it's, it's, uh, that, that, but when I was writing the book, I spent the, the two years that I spent writing the book. I think I, there wasn't a day when I didn't 
it doesn't go out for a long walk or a run or the, 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 having read all the material that I read, and particularly because of all the primary sources too, reading through, uh, you know, the, the personal papers of Arthur Harris, uh, because I, like many, had formed uh, a very strong view beforehand of Arthur Harris and, uh, and who this person was. And uh, the, the, his views didn't particularly change, actually, but, uh, but I, the, he, he, he gained dimensions that I didn't expect. And that's why I say that, that, uh, that if we count the bombing of Dresden as a war crime, then we have to say that there were a number of other bombings that have to count uh, in, in the same category, too. And we're talking from 1942 onwards, from the bombing of Lübeck, which was deliberately used as a laboratory to see if they could raise funds. And Lübeck had absolutely no military value or Anything at all. It was just simply chosen as a, we can get it, it's easy to get at, we're going to turn this into smouldering ruins. And that, yes, I mean, the, the, I would agree with it. If we're going to say that Dresden's crime, then I'll say that from 1942, those crimes have been committed in ever increasing numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, one major discussion of the whole problem, not as far as Dresden is concerned, but uh, the Allied uh, uh, bomb raids, uh, is of course uh, Wege Sebald and uh, Wege Sebald's book on the question, or rather they were lectures at first, um, on the question whether, um, for example, German writers had not properly reflected what was going on or not. But uh, in the discussion about this particular book by Sebald, um, one argument came up time and again which i think is is um, extremely important and, and and valid also in, in our connection uh, the fact that um, the ally bomb raids did not hit systematically the um, rail connections between those factories who for example produced uh, cyclone b um, and the extermination camps and these lines yeah. were known and this is something which, um, you know, is, is, is a problem which I don't think has been solved. Whether, why this was the case, for example, that they were not... Was it the case simply that their intelligence wasn't, just wasn't quite good enough uh, in all of these instances? I mean, for instance, uh, in the National Archives now, going back to the question of Dresden and Dresden as a bombing target, uh, yeah. there were some interesting maps uh, that the RAF had of Dresden, mm -hmm. but they were very out of date. Um, they, they, they marked basically where the hospitals were uh, and the railway station, but in terms of actually the infrastructure of Dresden, there was, there was nothing. And, and there was kind of, there's kind of dark comedy about that too, because it's kind of suggesting that uh, you know whatever you do, chaps, don't hit the hospitals. Uh, you know, here they are. If that kind of discrimination could be made, but yes, uh, when it comes to those particular targets, as you say, um, there are so many. Yeah, there are so many naughty questions. I've tried to find a kind of easy way out of it. I've tried to make an excuse for them, I suppose. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, right. Well, I think one thing is for sure, and this is uh, by no means um, cynical, but rather a moment. Uh, on the 14th of February, uh, it was Ash Wednesday. And I think, um, you know, the term Ash Wednesday uh, obtained a very new meaning if we think of the, the results of the 13th. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, yeah, any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Um, if this is not the case, yes, there is. Matthew Shaw, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, just, yes, can I hear you now? Wonderful talk, thank you, Sinclair. Um, I'm just oh, thank you. Do you know this uh, photographic essay by Richard Peter called Dresden eine Kamera klagt an? It was published in like 1949, I think. I'm afraid I don't know. Um... Uh, okay. Well, I I, just, I imagined that you would, but um, no, so, um, uh, not, no, not offhand anyway. Not not as memory serves. Um... The extraordinary, uh, gritty, austere black and white photographic essay which um, presents the uh, rather um, unfinished uh, reconstruction of Dresden and most of it still in, in ruins by a, a, a remarkable East German documentary photographer. Um, and what the question I was going to ask was uh, because uh, in, in the world of photography it's really rather well known was 
the extent to which uh, you thought it may have played a role in crystallizing the question of Dresden as a as a sort of question of conscience after the war of of, of both of of um, it being potentially describable as a British war crime and also of uh, the questions of conscience that relate to uh, its its uh, heritage in, in the Nazi uh, era. But if you haven't seen the book, you can't really comment on it. But I oh, well, but, yeah, but I can, but I, but I can, but I, but I can thank you very much for bringing up uh, a very interesting strand, which is, no, I haven't seen that. I would very much like to see the book, actually, because uh, the, the, all the photography that I have seen from that period is uh, is obviously sort of so kind of stark and so haunting. But the, the, the point, the brilliant point you make about uh, consciences being pricked and about guilt uh, and about the sense of and about the British, and particularly the, the British and the Allied sense of what they had done, I think is going is to fascinate me. And it was, it was the, the, the day after the raid uh, that Churchill himself uh, kind of shuddered with horror. Uh, what had been done to Dresden, and he said, that, "You know, that have we become beasts? Is this is this what we are?" And I think that, that there were questions asked in Parliament, um, uh, the, the, certainly before, but certainly afterwards too. I think it it, it did become emblematic uh, quite quickly of of the the the, 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 the that nightmare of of total war. Um, and as I say, the the the, the doctrine of so-called uh, morale bombing, which is basically uh, dropping bombs on the heads of civilians rather than uh, rather than army personnel. So yes, the the ruins of Dresden, uh, I think, would have had uh, would have preyed on the public consciousness. That of course, by August nineteen forty-five, the world also had the horror of what had happened to. Hiroshima and Nagasaki too, uh, plus there was the bombing of Tokyo in, in March 1945. But I suppose Dresden had that also particular significance because so many people in Britain were also aware of Dresden. As I say, it was it was famous, very famous in Britain because of the manufacture of porcelain. It was, it was a very frequent thing to find in households all over Britain to have an item of Dresden China. Dresden was a household name, but it was also, um, I mean, I found doing all sorts of research, uh, all sorts of people were very familiar with Dresden as a kind of holiday destination in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, you know, they're not just the posher people, not just the grand society, uh, you know, sort of swanning about, uh, but Cook's Tours. Uh, you know, sort of advertising, you know, take the boat from Harwich, take the train across Europe and come to Dresden. This, this wonderful, beautiful Baroque city uh, where you'll hear marvellous opera and you'll see marvellous art. Uh, there, were, there, there were all sorts of British holiday makers who, who made their way over to the, in the 1920s and 1930s. And so it was there, Dresden was there in, in the British public imagination. And, uh, 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 on a, the, the hideous, I don't know whether you're a Daily Telegraph reader or not. Um, I used to work for the Daily Telegraph from time, so it particularly fears me. The day after the Dresden bombing, uh, the, 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 the Telegraph's comedy column, Peterborough, uh, uh, made a, a very, very, very uh, ill-advised joke about, oh, well, it's just an RAF bull in a Dresden china shop. Mm. And you see, that was exactly the wrong thing. It was just, yes, it was exactly the wrong thing to make a joke about. You could see... They could sense the kind of the recoil off that. This is not. This is not what uh, Dresden meant to to British readers. It wasn't just a, a you know a, a porcelain fact would be smashed up. Everyone everyone knew that it was a, a, a certain repository of European culture, culture and art, which even if that had been briefly hijacked by the Nazis, stretched so 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 far back. Um, and so you can see that there were. I think that's probably why there were so many British visitors. Uh, to uh, you know, to the GDR, but particularly to Dresden in the sixties and seventies, there were some fantastic essays now to be read in the archives of the New York Re Review of Books, for instance, of, uh, of fascinated people who, who go over to uh, to see the reconstruction of Dresden in the nineteen fifties and the nineteen sixties. And also, I mentioned the GDR architecture, um, uh, a lot of which still remains. Actually, it's fascinating to walk around some of the housing estates uh, in Dresden now. Um, on the sort of uh, just outside the, sort of the inner rings of the city, um, which you can see uh, kind of, uh, original sort of Soviet blocks from the, the 60s, but they've been kind of um, uh, restored, uh, shall we say, that in the 1960s they didn't have sort of the, the hot water to work, and the heating wasn't always good. But you can see that the, the essence of it, um, 
wars can fundamentally involve meaning. Now, the, 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 the Communist uh, Party officials got the slightly grander apartments uh, in the old town. Um, uh, but there was, even in the, 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 the palace of culture that you see now uh, in the old town, built in the 1960s, there is a kind of, um, even in Soviet terms, there is kind of, there was a kind of flamboyant enjoyment uh, of it's, it's saying that this is this is still the center of culture. This is still the center of music. This is still the center. Of, and so, yes, the the reconstruction and the regeneration of Dresden are uh, formidably fascinating. And I'd very very much like to get hold of that uh, that, uh, that that photography book you mentioned. So. I'll pass the uh, if I pass the details to Jana, maybe she can uh, forward you the the reference. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm An great, absolute really pleasure. Wonderful Thank talk. You. Thank you. Thank you. We have a final question from uh, Kieran, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. We can hear you. Yes. First of all, thank you very much, Sinclair. It was a very interesting, very interesting talk. I wanted to ask a quick question, which is, I suppose, a, a quick comparison with Berlin and with Dresden. Um, because I think in, in Berlin, there are very many places where places which were destroyed have been repurposed in, to, in, in, in terms of facilitating memory. And on top of that, there are just very many places memorial sites I'm speaking of and, 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 and museums relating to the Holocaust, but also the, the Second World War in its entirety. And just because yeah. I, I'm wondering, because as you say, Dresden was reconstructed very similarly to how it previously looked, there's not the sort of space for this re repurposing or this reconstruction. I'm interested in, 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 the, in whether or not essentially there are many sites of memory in Dresden relating to the Second World War, relating to the Holocaust. I get the impression that a lot of the, the consciousness of the city is to do with its own destruction. And I'm interested to know whether Maybe I've misinterpreted that somewhat, but I'm interested to know no, whether. No, that's a, no, that's a, that's slightly my fault too, because I should have said that actually. The, 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 the built into the, the the structure of remembrance of the city is also remembrance of uh, of the, the Holocaust uh, and other horrors. I mean, rather like um, uh, rather like Berlin, there are, for instance, in Dresden, the the, the stumbling stones uh, with the names of, of of Jewish victims of the Holocaust. Uh, mm -hmm. The built in. Um, uh, yes, I mean, there are various other sites too. And I'll say that the remembrance of Dresden, I, I, I focused quite a lot on the reconstruction of the old town and the Frauen Kirche um, uh, because of its particular kind of Baroque beauty. And obviously, it's the thing that visitors from around the world come to see. But actually, the, the, there are all sorts of different layers of history to be found in all sorts of different corners of the town. And, this, and it, yes, I must say, the, the, the Dresdeners have been terrifically careful in the way that they've uh, curated that history, but they've also been quite careful uh, not to condemn the more recent past either, for instance. Uh, you know, it would have been tempting to get rid of the uh, the Soviet era GDR architecture, for instance, it would be very sweep all that away, uh, all those horrible sort of concrete blocks and think again. But in fact, actually, they, what they've done is they've they haven't, they've just repurposed them very, very, very slightly, but they, they remain. And even the old uh, pedestrian crossing traffic lights, uh, they've kept the old GDR ones, where the, 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 the green man has a hat on, uh, for instance. So uh, in, in a way, it's possibly slightly kitsch. There are some people who sort of point and uh, uh, with delight at it. But at the same time, I think it's, it's Dresden understands better than a lot of cities the importance of kind of honoring uh, all generations of the past, I suppose. Uh, there's the, 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 the central horror uh, of what happened in the war. And so the central horror of what happened to the Jewish population in Dresden too, in what had been such an amazingly, the, 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 the warm and open and tolerant and cosmopolitan city. But as I say, that, that, that understanding of history also stretches cunningly right the way back to the 18th century. Just the, 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 the delightful bells of the swing of Paris, uh, you can move through all sorts of different time zones in Dresden. Then you go to the more raucous shopping district of the Praga Strasse, for instance, but you still have the, kind of the 1960s slightly austere uh, modernists of that kind of the, the Khrushchev era kind of GDR. Uh, it's, it's, there is, there, also, there are, you're right, there, Berlin is, is, 
is a fantastic jumble of remembrance. Um, and every street is, you know, in, in certain districts are pot marked with bullet marks and, uh, uh, and there are all sorts of tokens of remembrance of everywhere, some official, some unofficial. But the same is true of Dresden too. Um, uh, there are corners of Dresden which don't even sort of highlight the fact that they have to do with uh, either remembrance, or, but they, they ignite uh, a glow in different generations. Um, it's interesting actually, at the, uh, and all the time I spent at Dresden, I have spent a lot of time poking around in the bookshops at Dresden. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's fascinated to see in the history sections of those bookshops, uh, personal accounts uh, of people writing their memoirs of the 50s and 60s and 70s uh, as a kind of nostalgia for the days of GDR. Uh, uh, in the sense of, the, the, all right, there may have been oppression, there may have been Stasi, but uh, but everyone had a guaranteed job and everyone had a guaranteed home. So you can see uh, <laughs> the kind of security of that. I was going to say, different generations of different people see, uh, have their own histories and see it in, in, in different ways and different ways. And Dresden, as much as Berlin, uh, does, I think, acknowledge and celebrate and accommodate uh, all sorts of different confluences and rivers of history. I think I thank you ever so much for this uh, wonderful talk and I think the lively discussion we had and many questions no, simply no, are thank you very much they were terrific questions thank you of uh, what you offered uh, to us I think um, in conclusion if there is a conclusion at all I keep thinking of um, um, the two famous lines that we have uh, of sonnet 30 when I summon up remembrance of things past I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought and what Shakespeare said in Sonnet 30, I think you have demonstrated that you've actually found a lot of things <laughs> and uh, in all the sighing, and uh, we are immensely grateful to you for it. No, well, thank you very much. With that, I thank you all for attending. I thank you for your contributions. And um, I'm already inviting you now for our next uh, lecture in the series on the 22nd of November by our colleague from UCL, uh, Katrina Urbach. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, a great honor to be asked and thank you so much for the great questions too. Thank you. Bye for now.